Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. It's very... Uh, I can... Yes, good morning. I've wanted to say good morning for a long time. <laughs> it's usually good evening, but it's still good morning, just. It's wonderful. Uh, so, yes, uh, my name is Robert Rowan and I drive an electric car. It could almost be a sort of member of a, the EV Anonymous group. Uh, 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 but uh, I, I had, was thinking if I had never been in an electric car or driven one, my perception of them would be very, very different. And I wonder why that is. You know, it's only a few years back they, they really didn't exist outside a laboratory or, in fact, the shed of a mad inventor. And believe me, through my work, I've been in plenty of those sheds <laughs> and seen some quite extraordinary uh, inventions. But they were, they were sort of weird things that we didn't really know about. And uh, if, I, if I just heard about electric cars today, I'd probably think they were going to be a bit rubbish because of batteries in laptops and phones. And we know batteries are a pain and they <coughs> run out and you have to replace them and they cost a lot of money. And what do we do with them when they're dead? And we throw them away. Landfill, guilt, guilt, guilt. I'm good at guilt. <laughs> uh, and I'd have been backed up in these perceptions by really a, a torrent of negative reporting in blogs and magazines and books and newspapers and very popular TV shows that just hammer away. They don't work. They're rubbish. They're stupid. They look ugly. And, you know, that was it. I would think that they were electric cars were completely rubbish. Occasionally, maybe just every now and then, as I refilled my petrol or diesel car with fuel and moaned about the cost of it, it might just occur to me to wonder where that fuel came from. Because, you know, I've been driving for nearly 35 years and it just comes out of the pump at the petrol station, doesn't it? But occasionally, <laughs> that's where it comes from. Occasionally I might have late night uh, nightmares fueled by, <laughs> fueled by reruns of Mad Max where, you know, the oil runs out. I'm a bit of an old hippie. It's like, oh man, like when the oil runs out, it's just going to go crazy. <laughs> So it's going to be one guy with a dog and a gun, and he's got to save his daughter who's on the other side of the country. There's no oil. It's like a nightmare. <laughs> There's only, what, 100,000 films like that. Uh, <laughs> however, in 2001, I had a very small uh, event to kind of changed my life a bit. I got a lift in this, a truly unremarkable Japanese car. Absolutely nothing to it. I was given a lift home when I was working in California. Got in the car, so what, drove home, and we stopped at traffic lights on the way home, and when we pulled away from the traffic lights, the car didn't make any noise. It was as if it was being pulled along by an invisible wire. And I became a bit of a hippie, going, oh, wow, man, that's like magic technology. How does that work? <laughs> and this was the first model of the Toyota Prius, which is now very much more common. This is the first one. It was introduced into California. I learned about hybrid technology. I didn't know anything about hybrid. It was a, a weird apple tree that my dad had in the garden where you'd plant one stick one bit of twig on another root and it grows into a hybrid. That's what I thought a hybrid was. <laughs> didn't know you could do that with cars. So, and then I found out why this car was developed. It didn't just appear out of the blue. It happened because of what was going on in Los Angeles. Now, I spent a lot of time in America in the 80s and 90s. I remember the very first visit I went to Los Angeles. It really did look a little bit like this. This picture was taken in Century City, Los Angeles, 1989. Los Angeles at that time had the highest level of childhood asthma due to airborne pollution. It was a chronic problem. If the wind was in the, wrong, the right direction or the wrong direction, depending on how you look at it, that uh, traffic created pollution caused really serious problems. So this organization called the Californian Air Resources Board introduced legislation into the Californian government which stipulated very, very clearly that no car manufacturer in the world could sell a car in California unless they also supplied a zero or ultra-low emission vehicle as part of their range. This caused a lot of trouble. There's a long story about it. I won't go on about it now, but there's a wonderful movie, in case you haven't seen it, that does depict this story very well. It's called Who Killed the Electric Car? It's a fascinating battle. Uh, it wasn't easy. <laughs> uh, over the uh, following years, things uh, really did start to change. Uh, the, the, so by 2005, really, I think that was really a, a kind of tipping point. Now, during this time, I started to hear more and more about developments in battery technology and electric drivetrains while I was working on an obscure television series. Uh, I don't know if you can see this picture, but this was actually the scrap heap dog walker. It was a machine that never made it to the screen for very, very good reason. <laughs> It was absolute rubbish. Uh, but while I was working on that, obviously I was uh, meeting an enormous amount of engineers and scientists from working on the show, particularly when we were in California, and uh, started to hear more and more about these cars. Now, I was a con very conv con uh, convicted, I should have been convicted, petrol head at the time, so it wasn't something I was particularly interested in, but I, it just started to pique my interest. I then heard a lot more about this man, Elon Musk. This is actually Elon giving a, a TED talk, in fact. Um, 
uh, he, he was a multi-millionaire. He set up a little, a little known uh, computer company called PayPal, which he sold for I don't even know how much more than we can ever count. Um, <laughs> but what he did really challenged the, the car makers, basically a bunch of Silicon Valley nerds, computer scientists and engineers, nothing to do with the automotive industry, completely from outside of it, started to toy around with electric vehicles because they knew how batteries work. They knew how to manage batteries. They knew what batteries could do. They were working with lithium-ion batteries that are in laptops and phones. They had a completely different view. Up to then, all electric cars had massive lead-acid batteries, and people said, they don't have the range. They don't last long enough. They're too big and heavy, which, of course, they were. But suddenly, from completely outside the automotive industry, there were these people who originally made cars with laptop batteries in the back. They went on to produce this. This is a car called the Tesla Roadster Sport, that uh, your laptops and phones have, say, between four and six little battery cells in them. This one has uh, 4,861 of the same battery cells in it. I was lucky enough to drive this car for a couple of weeks a few years ago. It is truly exceptional. It does 0 to 60 miles an hour in 3.7 seconds, which, if you don't know about that, that's quite fast. It hurts your bottom. <laughs> it definitely has an effect on the, the male sphincter. Is that the word? <laughs> Stuff happens. Uh, it's, it's an expensive two-seater sports car, slightly cheaper than a Ferrari, a Porsche, and an Aston Martin, but faster, which is very good. And it uses electricity and nothing else. So after that, uh, in 2009-10, uh, I was chosen to be part of a government-sponsored uh, scheme uh, to test out the uh, sort of living with an electric car every day. So I was given one of these cars, a, a Mitsubishi iMeV, it's called. It's a purely electric car, plug-in electric car. Had it for a year, drove 12,000 miles, and never in that 12,000 miles did I stand on the side of the road in the rain with a three-pin plug crying because there was nowhere to plug it in. <laughs> I never ran out, as all the newspaper articles told me I would. I had to plan. It's a, it's a complicated thing, but I did do it very, very successfully. Uh, I, 12,000 miles in that car, and one of the interesting things which I hadn't really thought about before I started driving with was what that would cost. Well, here is a very honest breakdown of the cost. So 12,000 miles... Plugged in at night using cheap rate off-peak electricity cost me £150. But I've been scrupulously honest because I did have to buy a screen wash. Screen washer cost me £7. <laughs> so the total was £157 for 12,000 miles. That doesn't necessarily mean anything until you compare it with the cars we drive today. So a super economy, tiny little petrol car that really does get 60 miles to the gallon and very, very few really do. It would cost you 1,260 miles just in fuel to do that distance. And I like to compare it with a Range Rover Sport because I think it's a fair comparison. And that would cost you £3,780 to do. So as you can see, a considerable saving in, in money, but also in actual total energy use, which is far more important. Um, <coughs> so, of course, as soon as you drive an electric car, you think to yourself, well, where does the electricity come from? It's all very well driving your holier-than-thou, eco-tofu, we're eating sandal-wearing green cars. <laughs> but that electricity comes from the national grid, as we all know, which comes from burning coal and gas and nuclear fuel, and maybe it's a bit of wind and a bit of solar. So are they really any cleaner? That's the, the question. Well, um, <coughs> I spent, through the work, my work in uh, television, I've been very lucky to, work it, to go to visit some of the most extraordinary manufacturing processes, giant engineering works, sewers. I mean, I could, wish I could have given a talk on the perception of sewers, because I do love sewers. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, one of the places I went to was... Uh, no, I haven't got a slide for this anymore. No, I've had to change my slides a bit. <laughs> I went to uh, an uh, oil refinery in West, uh, West Wales, in Pembrokeshire. It's one of the three big oil refineries in this country. When I arrived there, stopped at, got out of the car, looked over there. Next to the car park, massive uh, substation, electricity substation with two strings of pylon. And I looked at it, I went, oh, my God, I never knew that refining petrol also generated electricity. How cool is that? And so I went off, and then I was disabused of that very suddenly when I talked to the head of engineering, because it, obviously that electricity was coming the other way. It was coming directly from a coal-burning power plant to the refinery, where it is used to enable the refining process to take place. It's a very energy-intensive process. The head of the refinery told me that we use about the same amount of electricity as Coventry. <laughs> now, when I hear the arguments about dirty cars, dirty electric cars that are using electricity from coal, this is never used in that equation. Our petrol is a lot dirtier than we think or know. But then, of course, 
I also managed to film, spend a couple of days filming just down the road from here uh, at Drax B Power Station, which was a phenomenal experience, and um, seeing the train loads of coal arriving from Poland being burnt by the thousands of tons in this enormous facility that generates enough electricity for the whole of London, just one place. It is extraordinary. And that's where electricity comes from. So petrol cars, electric cars, they both have CO2 emissions, they both pre produce uh, pollutants in one way or another. That is the generally perceived reality. However, experience over a long time has shown me something slightly different. Um, one of the key things, I think, about electric vehicles, which a lot of people don't think about because we're used to what's normal, and what's normal is petrol and diesel, but electric cars are energy agnostic. They do not give a toss where the electricity comes from. <laughs> they just don't care. They're like teenagers with pocket money. They don't give a toss. The, uh, the electric car I drive now will use electricity from anywhere. It doesn't care. Solar, wind, nuclear, coal, gas, doesn't care. I could even pedal for 22 hours a little generator and charge it like that. It would still work. So I think that's a very important thing because the cars we use now are not energy agnostic. They can only use the fuels they're built for. And that, I think, is a very important point. So for the last two years, I've been driving one of these, a Nissan Leaf. It's made just down the road in Sunderland in the most extraordinary plant. I just went there the, uh, last, a couple of weeks ago. I was there with uh, the current prime minister. It's a great privilege, the two of us, for him to go around with me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he did, I'm going, to, I'm going to show off a little bit. He did nod at me when he walked past. He went, ah, oh, like that. I, I got that. <laughs> and I went, oh. Oh, hello. <laughs> I didn't vote for you. <laughs> uh, very, it was a very silly moment. Um, <laughs> but when I got the Nissan Leaf two years ago, it was sort of when I really kind of took the leap. I thought I'm going to go the whole hog. So I also did this. It's one of the most unflattering pictures I've ever had. This is me and my solar panels. So I had some solar panels fitted. I'm having another load put in uh, this year. Uh, because what, a consumer research has shown that as soon as people put solar panels on their roof, they want an electric car. And as soon as people got an electric car, they want solar panels on their roof. Why? Well, the simple reason is this. In the summer of 2011, I'm going to have to refer to my figures here because I can never remember numbers. I drove 4,300 miles in the Nissan Leaf for absolutely nothing, for zero fuel cost, not a penny. 4,300 miles from those panels that charge the car. Uh, I plugged the car in in the daytime, which I don't normally do if it was sunny, and I didn't plug it in in the daytime if it wasn't sunny. But the engineers who were doing all the assessment of my energy use told me that's how far I'd done. So it, uh, over the, uh, the two years I've had the panels, they have produced 5,104 kilowatt hours of electricity in total, and the car has consumed 8,215. So clearly not enough to run the entire car the entire year, but a fairly big chunk. There's no way you can... I can't build an oil refinery in my back garden and an oil rig. <laughs> I would. If I could, I'd do it. I wouldn't get planning permission, but I'd do it. So in the two years since we've been driving the car we've, uh, and had the solar panels, our electricity bill has less than halved. And in fact, just this week, which is very nice that it came through, I got a bill from my electricity supplier which said that I'm in credit for £287. And we are charging two electric cars, running a house with loads of teenagers coming and going. And we've got, and, you know, so solar panels work. Uh, our petrol bill has all but disappeared because we drive one of these. Uh, much loathed by certain television presenters. This is the Toyota Prius plug-in version. In the winter, I get between 75 and 80 miles to the gallon. In the summer, I get between 95. And in fact, the other night, I drove, did 119 miles to the gallon on a 70-mile drive. So... It is a much more economic way of driving. Uh, um, if we, now, one of the big questions that often comes up is, if we all had electric cars, the national grid would just melt, and I'd be the main culprit. It would all be my fault. <laughs> well, I was lucky enough to spend a day filming at the national grid with these people. These are actual engineers who run the actual national grid who say, have a slightly different opinion. They say that now, today, we could charge two million electric cars in this country with no changes to any of the infrastructure or generating capacity of the country. Why is that? Because we would plug them in at night. Now, hopefully you can see this graph. This is a graph from uh, the elect total electricity demand of this country in July last year. And you can see this pattern. It's very, very obvious. They call it the bathtub effect. So at night, there's the, uh, in the daytime and the evening, there's a huge peak in demand, then it drops off overnight. That is a very expensive and difficult thing to manage. They have to turn power stations off. When you see a wind turbine not turning, it's not because it's broken, it's because a guy in the national grid has gone, we don't need that one or that one. They turn them off because they're generating too much power. Wind power is too effective. That's one of the problems we've got. The way to fill this bathtub to make the 
the, to smooth out that curve is if there were two million electric cars. They would also act as a storage system. Now, this particular picture isn't a car charging. This electricity is going the other way. And this and Leaf's battery can run the average UK house for two days. So if there were tw two million electric cars, that would be a massive, massive battery that the national grid desperately needs. These are some of the arguments in favor I'm giving you now. Uh, <coughs> so, the, they don't have the range. That's the most common one. They don't have the range. All I can say about that is you can't drive 27,500 miles in an electric car if it's so rubbish you run out every 15 minutes and burst into tears as Jeremy Clarkson drives past in a Range Rover Sport. <laughs> you just wouldn't make that many miles. You might do 50 miles and then you kick it in the ditch and get on with your life. Uh, so I think it's a very well-known statistic. 90% of journeys in this country are 27 miles or under. Any electric car can do that. Just to give you a clue what's coming to this country very soon, already in America, very successful, this is the Tesla Model S. It's made by uh, uh, Tesla, uh, Elon Musk company. They cannot make enough. They are uh, over-ordered for years. It has a range of 300 miles on a charge. It is faster 0 to 60 than any other car in its class, which means large saloon cars. BMW 7 Series, big posh flash, big cars, Maseratis. This leaves them in the dust. It's very uh, an extraordinary interior. And one last thing for if there are a few macho men in the room, Yes, it does burn rubber. Because <laughs> that is very important when you're going down to Tesco's to get a litre of milk. You've got to burn rubber. We know how important that is. Now, why did I want to call this talk uh, 1.6 million barrels of misperception? That is because that is how many barrels of oil we import into this country every single day of the year. 1.6 million barrels from elsewhere. Money leaving our economy, going elsewhere. I think that electric cars will not save the world. They won't solve our energy problems. They won't make the world a better place. But they might start making us think about the way we operate now and what we accept as normal now. And we might start questioning that and trying to take a different uh, avenue in the future. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.